morning, Miami Whitewater. Good morning to all of you who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube and our website as well. We're glad that you are all with us today as we gather together and continue this series of final words. I want to challenge you to all kind of wave to each other like we did last week and just kind of greet each other, wave to the camera back there. I don't know if they'll be able to see you, uh, but no, we're waving to you as well. And, and we just are so glad to be in the presence of God this morning. And we're going to be changing stuff up a little bit. Karen's going to be at the front this, this time and the band at the end. So uh, we are excited about what God is doing in this place. And I hope that you've come ready to meet with Jesus Christ today. We'd encourage you to make sure to fill out those connection cards, either uh, in person if you're online. There's a, a link that will be posted in the Facebook feed so you can fill that out for us as well. So let us stand then and join together in worship.
be seated. As we come now to the part of our service where we bring God our tithes and our offerings, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all that you have done for us, for the work that you showed to us on the cross that displayed your love, that made your grace and your mercy so real and amazing. And so in these moments, Lord, we come to give back to you, to give of ourselves, to give of our time, to give of our energy, to give of our resources. May you bless them. May you use them in order to bless this community and this world with the grace that we have first found in Jesus Christ. Amen. There are baskets that are located on the sides and at the back of the room that you may bring your offering to. You may also go online to mymw.org and click on Give. If you're joining us on Facebook, that link will be posted in the Facebook feed as well. So let us bring our gifts to the Lord. Kids, how are you this morning? Well, I am really glad that you are here today. And we are, I need you guys to help me play a game. We're going to put some pictures up here on the screen. And I need you to help me figure out who the people in the pictures are. It's going to be a silhouette, so you're not going to be able to see their faces or anything. So let's get the first one up there. Who's that? Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker. That's right, Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker. Good job. Who's that? Mario and Luigi. Good job. The Incredibles. That's right. Yep, Phineas and Ferb. 
<laughs> Good job. That's right. Yep, Lilo and Stitch. One more. Lion King. That's right. So can anyone tell me what all these pictures have in common? Alex? They're all pictures? What, what about the pictures? What, Al Allison? Yeah, they're all in TV or movies. And Jeffrey? That's right. You can't see their faces. Any other? Ashlyn? That's right. They are all types of families, aren't they? We've got the Incredibles, a superhero family. Mario and Luigi are brothers. We've got uh, Lilo and Stitch. You know, yeah. But are all of these biological families? No, they're not, are they? And some of them look kind of weird. Like Lilo and Stitch, have you ever heard of people adopting an alien? <laughs> or like in The Lion King, you know, you've got these animals who are living together who really aren't even supposed to get along. They're supposed to be enemies and eating each other. So, you know, these families are created by people or animals who choose to have a relationship with people who are not in their biological family, people they're not actually related to, and in some cases, people that they're even really different from. You know, of course, we have our biological families too, right? And when, but did you know that we also have a different kind of family? Yeah, when we love Jesus, that makes all of us family with all the other people in the whole world who also love Jesus. It makes us brothers and sisters. That means that all of us in this room are part of our Jesus family, that people who are going to church at all the other churches in Harrison are part of our Jesus family. People who love Jesus all over the world in places like Mexico, China, uh, Africa, they're part of our Jesus family, too. How do you think this might change how we look at people? Jeffrey? <laughs> Alex? What? <laughs> do you think maybe it might make us, it might help us show, it might help show us how to love them? Better? Like, we love our family, right? We do things for our family that we don't do for other people. So if we think about everyone as part of our family, it can help show us how to love them. We want to help them and take care of them. And today, Pastor Justin is going to talk about how Jesus asked his disciples to take care of his mom like she was part of their family. He was giving them a new family. He was changing what it meant for them to be family. He was giving them a Jesus family. So like Jesus in that story, God asks us to take care of our Jesus family too. So this week, I'm going to challenge you guys to look for something that you can do for someone in your Jesus family. Can you do that? Cool. Cool. Thanks so much, Melissa. That was great. Let us pray. Gracious Jesus, we are so grateful to be stepping into your family, to be welcomed by you, by your grace and your mercy. And so we come into this place because we need to hear from you. Lord, we need you to shape us. We need you to speak to us, to mold us, so that we can become the kind of people that you desire for us to be. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading for today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. 
Let us hear the words of the Lord. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Let's hear a brief monologue from Mary, the wife of Clopas. I begged her not to follow as Jesus was led to be crucified. Mary, it would be too hard. You don't want to see this. But she said to me, I will not let my son die among these wolves. And so we went, joined by only one of his disciples, the young John, and by Mary of Magdala. Jesus' mother was a strong, determined woman. She loved her son as much as any woman ever loved a son. He was to her the joy of her life and the purpose of her existence. Jesus had sought to prepare her for what, what lie ahead in Jerusalem. Somehow, she had, ar- she had always known that he would die as a young man, giving his life to save the world. Mary was determined to stand near Jesus as he suffered. She would fight to hold back the tears, seeking to show her son some strength and love. She would do all she could, standing there to ease his pain and to give him hope. As the crowd hurled their insults, Mary slowly pushed her way through until she stood before him. There he hung, naked as to hum- humiliate in wretched pain. Jesus' feet were two feet off the ground, and from where Mary stood as she could reach up and touch his chest, though the Roman guards forbade such things. As we stood there, Mary said to Jesus, I love you, my son. Our father will soon come for you. You are in his hands. I love you. It was then that Jesus looked at his mother and spoke slowly and tenderly to her. Dear woman, this is now your son and nodded his head toward John. And then to John, he said, here is your mother. John placed his arm around Mary and held her as if to say to Jesus, I understand, I will take care of her. Well, Sharon had been in and out of foster care ever since the time that she was two. She was lonely. She was confused. She was in deep, deep pain. And the only way that she really knew how to express the feelings and the pain that she felt was by kicking and screaming and throwing tantrums of all sorts. And because she acted up so often, each and every foster mom that she had had would eventually send her back to the agency. And so by the time she was seven, Sharon thought that she was completely unlovable. She felt rejected by every mom that she had ever had, by every person who had came into contact with her. And that's when she met Kate. Kate was a single woman, and Kate desperately longed to adopt a child and to raise a child as her own. And and she could sense that Sharon was a bit afraid. She could sense the pain that was in her eyes, and so she spoke tenderly to her. She said, "I, I know your fear. I know you've been hurt. I know you're scared, but but I promise you that I will never send you away, no matter what, that we are family now. And so every day she would tell Sharon how much she loved her. But yet that wasn't enough to, to heal the wounds that were so real and so deep in Sharon's life. And, and so she kept acting up and she kept waiting and waiting and waiting for Kate to eventually send her back. She tried to hurt Kate before Kate could hurt her. And so she did everything that she could. She picked fights over little things. She slammed doors. She screamed. She did everything that she could think of. Well, one day after school, she was watching TV, and Kate came in, turned it off, told her, you need to go finish your homework first, and then you can come and watch TV. And Sharon wanted nothing to do with it. She took her books, she threw them across the room, broke a few things in the house, and and, and then she waited. She waited to be sent back. And and after a while, when that didn't happen, she turned to Kate and said, aren't you going to send me back? 
And Kate said, I don't like the way you're acting right now, but I'm never going to send you back. I love you, and we're family. And families don't give up on each other. And it was at that moment that Sharon realized that this mom was different than every other mom that she had had throughout her life. This mom wasn't going to get rid of her. This mom actually did love her as her own child. And today marks the third Sunday in Lent. And throughout this season, we are focusing in on the seven final words that Jesus spoke from the cross. We're looking at what these words have to say to us about who Jesus is and, and, and what, who we are called to be as the people of God. In our first week, we heard Jesus speak words of forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Last week we saw Jesus speak words of salvation as he spoke to the criminal who was hanging on the thief with him, saying, today you will be with me in paradise. And today we turn to a word of compassion. When Jesus sees his mother and the disciple that he loves standing nearby at the foot of the cross, he says to his mother, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. What do these words have to say to us? I want to suggest at least three things today. And the first one's probably the most obvious, so we're not going to spend a ton of time on this first one. And the first one is that this, that these words remind us to care for our parents and fulfillment of the fifth commandment to honor your father and your mother. They remind us that, that we are to care for our parents in their old age. You see, women in that day and age, they didn't have ownership rights. They couldn't own property. And so they would spend their entire lives dependent on the men that were in their lives. First it was their father, and then it was their husband. And once he died, it was their sons. And that responsibility, by law, would pass to the oldest son to take care of his mother. And of course, Jesus was Mary's oldest child, and so he had a legal responsibility to take care of her after he passed. And so in those final moments, he, he turns in his dying breast to provide for her, to provide for her future, to provide for her security, to provide care and comfort and compassion through the disciple who stands there with her at the foot of the cross. Adam Hamilton puts it like this in his book, Final Words, which is the inspiration for this series. He says, in this tender conversation, we see the fifth commandment, God's call for humanity to honor our mothers and our fathers. We live in a day and a time when many of our parents may not have adequately prepared for retirement. According to a recent survey, he says, of workers 55 and older, 36% said that they had saved less than $25,000 for retirement. As pensions disappear and social security benefits decrease while medical costs continue to skyrocket, we need to reclaim what was the practice throughout most of human history, caring for one's parents as Jesus is asking John to do for his mothers, that we hear in these words this reminder to care for our parents. The second thing that we really see here is that these words remind us that Jesus sees our pain, that he sees us as we really are, exactly with whatever it is that that we may be experiencing right now. He sees our pain. I want you just to imagine for just a moment that you are Mary. I want you to kind of put yourself into her shoes and and imagine all that she is going through in this moment. Imagine the pain, the tears, the heartache, the grief that she is struggling with as, as she watches her son dying in such a violent and brutal and horrific way. I mean, for Mary, this isn't about theology. For Mary, this isn't about God dying for the forgiveness of sins. For Mary, this is about her son, 
her child, her, her pride, her joy. This, this is about the son that she held in her arms as she, she wiped his tears from his eyes. I mean, imagine the memories that, that are flooding her mind in that moment. The kind of pain that she is wrestling with. I mean, no mother should have to watch their child die, let alone watch him suffer in this kind of way. No, no mother should have to go through that. I mean, can you hear the questions that, that are, she's wrestling with in her mind right now? Why did this have to happen, God? Why here? Why now? Why in this way? Why, 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 God? Why did this have to happen? Can, can you hear her, her heartache and her questions? You know, maybe you can identify with Mary's pain. Maybe you can identify with her story. Maybe you can identify with her tears and her heartache. Maybe even with some of the questions that, that she is asking in this moment. I mean, in all, light of all that we've been through in this last year, as we come almost to the, the anniversary of when this whole thing started, I mean, it would make sense if, if we are feeling the pain and the heartache and the rawness of this kind of moment. You know, maybe some of you have watched a loved one die in the last year. Maybe there are some of you who have gotten some really bad news, whether that's a health diagnosis of some sort that just shocked you and, and knocked you off your, your, your rocker. Maybe, maybe it was some financial news, whatever it was, maybe there's been something that you are wrestling with right now. Maybe it's something you haven't told even one other person. And you can identify with this question, why? You see, in that very moment, Jesus looks up and he sees his mother standing there. He sees her tears he sees her heartache. He sees her pain. He sees her grief. He sees everything that she's going through, the horror that's in her face. And his heart goes out to her. This is what we see Jesus doing all throughout the pages of the gospel, that he sees somebody in real pain, and his heart goes out to them and compassion, and care, and concern. And so he speaks these words, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. Let me, let me assure you that Jesus sees your pain. He knows what you're going through. If he saw his mother at the foot of the cross with all of her heartache and tears and chose to respond in love and compassion, then in the same way, he sees all of us who are his children. He sees what we're going through. He sees our pain. He knows how you feel. You're not alone. You're not alone. And just like he spoke to Mary as he hung on the cross, in the same way he looks out, he sees to you, and he wants to speak similar words of compassion into the situation that you're facing right now. No matter how hard it is, no matter how bleak it looks, no matter how hopeless you feel, Jesus wants to speak words of compassion. So if you're hurting right now, I want to challenge you in the next day, in the moments after the service, maybe even right now, that you would take some time just to sit in the silence and listen for his voice. Listen for his words of compassion and love and care. Listen to him reaching out. Listen to these words, knowing that he sees you. He longs to provide for you right where you are. 
because he sees your pain. And then finally, these words show us a model for how the church is to care for each other. This is some of what Melissa was getting into with the illustrations that she was making about Lilo and Stitch and, and uh, you know, the Lion King. It's about how we are to care for one another. You see, throughout the New Testament, one of the most predominant images that, that God used to talk about the church is the image of family. Right? That, that if, if we come into the body of Christ, if we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then that changes our relationship with each other. We are now brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family in the very real meaning of the word family. You know, I find it so profound Throughout Jesus' ministry, he gives a lot more attention to spiritual family than he does to biological family. A, a lot more attention. In fact, there was one time he was teaching a group of people and his mother and his brothers arrived on the scene and they, they sent word to Jesus. Right? They told him, we're here. And Jesus looks at the people around him and this is what he says. Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And looking at those who are seated around him, listening to what he is saying, listening to his teaching, he says, look, here are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. Here are my mother and brother and sister. He completely, in that one saying, redefines what family is all about. Right? The family is not about biological ties in the kingdom of God. That family is about something deeper, something more real, something that, that, that connects us through the very power of God. It's about our spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. He completely redefines family, and we see this over and over and over again in his ministry. That there's another story where a guy comes up and Jesus uh, says, follow me. And, and, and the guy says, well, let me go bury my dad because he's just died. And Jesus looks at him and says what well, sounds very insensitive. He says, let the dead bury the dead. You come and follow me. Right? He completely redefines priorities. That discipleship is about more than our biological connection to those that we are physically related to. That it's about spiritual connection in Jesus. In fact, when Jesus calls his very first disciples, when he calls James and John from the boat, the Bible says that they leave their father behind in the boat and they go and follow him. They leave him behind even though they had responsibility to care for him. Even though the fifth commandment said honor your father and your mother, they leave their family behind to follow Jesus. And then there's Luke 14, 26, which is probably the most radical statement about family that Jesus makes in the entire gospel. He says, whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, spouse and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Now let me just clarify what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that, that biological family isn't important. He's not saying that they don't matter. Right? He's not saying that we are to literally hate and dismiss our family I mean, there's lots of other passages, including the fifth commandment, that says that we are to care for each other. We are to provide for each other. He even calls the Pharisees out because they're trying to dismiss the law and not care for their biological family. But what Jesus is doing is he's making a point about discipleship. That discipleship is, is far more 
important, that, this, that, that the most important connections that we have are not our physical, biological connections, but they are our spiritual connections in the family of God. Our spiritual connections in the family of God because disciples, by definition, nurture and provide and care for each other as family. This is who we are. This is what we are called to do, to live every day in relationship with Jesus. And as we are in relationship with Jesus, that is going to compel us to love our brothers and our sisters in the family of God. It's going to compel us to start to treat people different because just as we are born into a physical family, when we are born into the kingdom of God, we are born into a spiritual family. And the spiritual always takes precedent over the physical. And it's no surprise then that when Jesus hangs here on the cross and he speaks these words, notice who they are not directed to. They're not directed to his physical biological brothers. I mean, Jesus had other brothers. You know, James, uh, the guy who wrote the book of James, was Jesus' brother. He had other brothers who, by law, would have had the responsibility to take care of his mom. Instead, he chooses a disciple, the spiritual connection. He chooses someone that's called the disciple that Jesus loved. We're never told exactly who this is in the Gospel of John, even though most people think it's probably John himself. We're never actually told who this disciple is because John wants us to hear that this guy is the example of the ideal disciple of Jesus Christ. Right? That the three times that we see the beloved disciple, we see him first leaning into the bosom of the Lord, right? There's intimacy and relationship with God. The second time is here. And the third time that we see him is at the empty tomb. And he walks in, and like every, unlike everyone else, he simply sees the empty tomb and he believes. Right? An ideal example of what a disciple of Jesus Christ is meant to look like. And so Jesus entrusts his mother to the church all, if Jesus simply wanted to provide for Mary's care, all he had to say was, John, here is your mother. But instead, he says something that is two-sided. He, he, he gives no names. Neither Mary nor this disciple are named. And he speaks first, not to the disciple, but to his mother. Woman, here is your son. And then to the disciple, here is your mother. Notice both of them are responsible. It's not just John caring for Jesus' mother. Both of them are responsible to care for each other. Right? In his final words, Jesus is establishing a new kind of family, a spiritual family that is to supersede the physical, earthly, biological relationships that they have. And so a number of scholars will, will actually say that this isn't, isn't about bio, biology here. Fleming Rutledge says it this way, both the disciple and Mary represent the way that family ties are transcended in the church by ties of the Spirit. Raymond Brown says to interpret this relationship between Jesus and his mother in terms of filial, biological care is to reduce his thoughts to the level of the flesh. That there is something more profound that he's trying to say about how we are connected to each other in the life of the church. In Adam Hamilton's book, he tells a couple of stories. The first is a story about Roger and Jonathan and 
Roger was an elementary school teacher in the community near where Hamilton's church was. And, and, and one night, several, several years ago, Roger was out working late like elementary teachers tend to do. He was grading papers, doing all that kind of stuff. And he left to go home. It was already dark outside, so very late. And he notices out on the playground this little boy, Jonathan, fourth grader, kid that was in his class. And so naturally, he thinks, man, he's here really late, all by himself, not a single adult around. He, and so he, said, he decides he's going to go out and talk to this little boy, find out what in the world is going on. And, and he finds out that his mother had left the family, and his father was doing the best that he can. He was working all night long, just struggling to care for this little boy. And so Roger sent him home. He assured him things were going to be okay. And in the following days, he started to take a very special interest in this little boy. He started to care for him. He started to love him. And, and eventually, you know, social services came in. The father couldn't take care of the child the way that he needed to. He ended up in the foster care system. Eventually, he turned his life around. He got back where he got his child back. And but then things started to spiral out of control again. And he knew he was going to lose his child again. So the dad went to Roger and he asked him if he could take him in. If he could watch over him. And so Roger agreed. And he welcomed him as his son and he gave him a life and a future that he never had before. With his help, Jonathan went to college and today... He lives in Chicago where he is working with inner city boys who were just like him, who had no place to call home. But Roger heard Jesus say, behold your son. Behold your son. And then he tells a story about Faye. Faye had, was serving in a ministry for seniors at her local church. And one of the women who attended that group was a woman by the name of Betty. And uh, Betty was a woman whose health was going downhill. She was fighting Alzheimer's. She was rapidly decreasing. And yet Faye continued to love her as if she was her own mom. She was there for her day after day. She visited her in the home. She talked with her. She smiled at her. She, even as she approached the end of life, she was there by her bedside holding her hand, because she heard Jesus say, Behold, your mother. And then Adam Hamilton says this. He said, John intends for us to understand from Jesus that as his disciple, we are responsible to care for one another, each taking on the role of a parent or a child or a brother or a sister to anyone and everyone who needs it. It's a call for us to treat each other in the family of God as if we really were moms and dads and brothers and sisters. As if we really were family. And so what's that look like? I want to conclude with one very quick thought that a family loves and supports one another no matter what. They, they love and they support, they care for each other no matter what. You know, one of my favorite movies is The Lord of the Rings. And towards the very end of The Return of the King, there's this one scene that's incredibly powerful. Frodo has been carrying the ring for a very long time now. He's worn out, he's drained, and he doesn't have the power to go on anymore. And so Sam picks him up. And he puts him on his shoulders and he says, I may not be able to carry it, but I can carry you. I might not be able to carry it, but I can carry you. And that's why, how we are called to love and support each other. We not, might not be able to carry every single thing that each of us are going through, but we can carry each other. We can love each other. We can encourage each other. We can pray for each other. We can build each other up. We can support each other. We can carry one another's burdens when we can't go on anymore. We're called to be family. Just like we would with any 
other physical family, like when our, when our parents or our kids or our grandkids, whoever they are, when they are hurting, we're there. Right? We're praying for them. We're seeking God's face. We, we show up at the hospital. We show up at those places because we love them and we care for them. We're there. And the same needs to be the case in the life of the church. That we are to show up for each other. The truth is we make time for the people who are important to us. Right? We go to their sporting events. We go to their concerts. We go to their things. We make time for the people who are important for us. And so the question I want to ask you is how much time are you taking to invest in each other, not just in this one hour on Sunday morning, but on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday? How much time are you investing in one another? You know, I think about the book of Acts. They were completely devoted to each other. The Bible tells us they held everything in common. They sold their possessions. They sold their goods to the point that there was not a single need among them. I mean, that's the kind of dedication that they had to one another in the church. And because of that, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, they, they took Jesus' call here at the cross seriously. You know, one of the things that has been said about this church ever since I got here four years ago is that this church is family. That this church is a church where people really care for each other, where they really love each other desperately. And I've seen that. I've seen it in profound ways. But in this last year, we've lost some of that. We have lost a lot of that. The thing that is our greatest strength is beginning to become our weakness. And so I want to challenge you again to reclaim who you are. Love each other, care for each other, support each other, be there for one another, call each other, text each other. Reclaim your strength. And heed Jesus' words here to find a spiritual mom and a spiritual dad and a spiritual son and a spiritual daughter and a spiritual brother and a spiritual sister. I want you to look at the person on your right. Look at the person on your left. Look at the person in front of you. Look at the people behind you. Look at the people whose comments are on Facebook. Right? Look at the people across this room. These are your sons and your daughters, your brothers and your sisters, your moms and your dad. These are the people that Jesus is speaking about when he says, here is your son. Here is your mother. And so I want to ask you, will you embrace the dying words of Jesus to truly care for each other as family again? Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you. We come to you because these words are challenging. We admit that we have not loved one another as you have loved us. And so in these moments, Lord, we ask first for your forgiveness. And second, that you would bring a face to our mind, maybe someone in this room that we don't know at all, that we would start to invest in as you invested in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior.
on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took simple, ordinary bread. And he broke it. And he gave it to each of them to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as often as we eat of this meal and we drink of this cup, we proclaim a great mystery that Christ has died, that Christ is risen, and that Christ will come again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and grape juice. Make them to be for us the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we may be your people, sent into the world to be a new spiritual kind of family. We ask this in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Just a few instructions as we come to communion today. You do not have to be a member of this church to partake in Holy Communion. This meal was a gift that was given by the grace of God. And so therefore, it is for all of you. The way that we will do this today is the ushers will dismiss you. We ask that you keep your social distancing as you come forward. They will give you a squirt of hand sanitizer and then As you come forward, simply hold out your hands. Uh, Sue will drop a piece of the bread into your hands, and Jackie will hand you uh, the little cup of wine. Return to your seats. At that time, you may remove your mask to eat of the bread and drink of the cup, and we ask at that point you put them back on. So let us come. The table is ready. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He would give His only Son to be a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away. Which my the chosen one bring many sons to glory? Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed. I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin which held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Father's love for us, how vast the 
beyond all measure that he should give his only son to a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which by the chosen my sin which held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me home I know that it is finished I will Boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give it. I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom.
can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love Love, love, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. announcements relating to kids events so Justin asked me to do that this morning uh, the first is the Harrison Recreation Commission contacted us and asked us to be part of the city Easter celebration that they are doing at the community center um, it's not really an Easter egg hunt they're not uh, hiding eggs in the grass and having kids run after them they're having a drive-through event where they will have community organizations stationed at various spots along a path. They'll have some other entertainment like jugglers and hula hoopers and things like that too. And they asked our church to have a booth. So we are going to be there the Saturday before Easter. So it's April 3rd from 9 to 11 in the morning. And we invite anyone who is available to come and be at the booth with us. We think this is a great opportunity to be a presence in the community and shine a light in that way. Uh, we'll be making balloon animals and ha handing them out to the kids as they drive through. Each booth will be handing out something different. And then we also wanted to do something that was our church event. So instead of having an Easter egg hunt here at the church, we are going to pick a few select neighborhoods in the Harrison area and we are going to advertise that we will be going to these neighborhoods at a specific time. It will be the afternoon of April 3rd and we'll meet here at the church at 140 and then go out from there but we will be in specific neighborhoods handing out candy to the kids in that area. Um, and then the second announcement is from Cole. Actually, Do you want to? Sure. Um, as you can see, we got started on this light box project a while back, and our goal was to have this kind of finished up by um, by the end of by by Easter. But um, it's hard to do that when the boxes are floating around and still getting strong. So if you have one of those boxes or you're willing to help out with that, let us know. Um, we'd like to get those back. I've ordered the rest of the parts and pieces that we need to get it back up and going. And we'd like to have this wall completed, if we could, by Easter, uh, God willing. So. Uh, that'd be good. And one other announcement um, for those of you that may uh, have forgotten, it's been uh, a, a week, but um, Hal London's celebration of his life will be uh, on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. There is a visitation from 4 to 7 at LaSalle High School so on Monday night. So you can go then to repay respects. But if you could come out and make it, we'd love to have a great show of support from y'all on Tuesday morning at 10. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you 
and empower you to show love to everyone in your Jesus family. Amen. 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 Hmm? Huh?